Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Welcome back to my channel, My Liverlies. If you've never been here before, thank you so much for clicking on my video. I am so happy you found me. I do so hope that you will like and subscribe before you leave. Become part of the Mama family. Mama's got your back, at least where makeup's concerned, and definitely when that makeup is cheap. Today is True Love Tuesday, and we are talking about, quite possibly, one of my favorite pop singers of all time. We're talking about Miss Jessica Simpson and her many attempts at finding true love. Before we get started, a very special, very warm welcome to any of those that are new to my channel. I am so incredibly happy that you are here. If you enjoy the content, I do so hope that you will mash that thumbs up button. I hope that you will subscribe if you have not already. And I hope that you will ring my bell, turn on your notifications, so that way, next time I upload a video, you can come right back here and we can hang out together again. Also, my eye makeup is already done. I'm in love with it. Turned out really, really pretty, very easy as well. I did, of course, do a TikTok on today's eye look, just in case you're interested. I'll make sure to have the, ta the tags for that, as well as all of my other socials, Facebook, Instagram, all that good stuff listed in the description box below. Guys, if you are not following me on all my other socials, you definitely should go do that. I post fun content every single day. And if you're following me everywhere, you don't have to worry about missing a single moment of it. Also, I am very, very sick. If you guys can hear it in my voice, I do apologize. Shawnee Bear came home. He went on a field trip. He was gone for a week and he came home sick. And because I had missed that boy, like I had lost a piece of my soul, I could not stay out of his face. So I, of course, caught it very quickly thereafter. And I'm on the upswing now, but it's still there. So if you guys can hear it in my voice, I'm very, very sorry. I also am just a little bit winded because I cannot breathe. So I do apologize for that as well. Also, if you see me looking over in this direction, it is because I am looking at my notes. There are a few of them for today's video. I assume we're going to be here for just a little while, as always. So I hope that you will sit back, get comfy, get cozy, get you a big old glass of something to drink, and let's go ahead and dive right in. When it comes to Jessica, I think she is, she's pretty much a forgotten pop star. I feel like she was super, super big in the early 2000s. And then somehow she kind of just like dropped off. Maybe not the early 2000s, definitely the early 2000s. The early 2000s into like 2010 maybe. But then she just kind of dropped off the face of the earth. And we really haven't heard a lot from her since then. And I think about her sometimes. And y'all, she's had just some really iconic moments. I know that we all remember the newlyweds when she first married Nick Lachey. I remember the the tuna, the, the chicken of the sea incident, is this chicken, is this tuna, like that whole thing. And because of that, I feel like uh, she just kind of like gets written off, right? Uh, but when it comes to her, I just feel like she has definitely, she's beaten the odds, right? Because at this point, she's kind of more famous for being famous, kind of like the Kardashians, than she is for like being a singer or a pop star or an actress anything like that. She's just kind of somebody you know is famous, despite all of the naysayers, and despite everyone really not thinking that she was going to make anything of herself, she truly has been incredibly successful. Uh, she has a net worth of upwards of $200 million. She is one of the most successful uh, fashion brands in the world, let alone in like uh, backed by a celebrity. She truly is kind of remarkable, y'all. She has battled abuse, financial abuse, uh, specifically from her father, Joe. She has battled uh, addictions and crippling insecurity, and she's come out the other side as quite a bit of a success story. Uh, she is a successful mother of three. She has had a successful relationship with her husband, Eric Johnson, going on like 13 years at this point. So I do think she was able to get it right uh, in the long run. But boy, oh boy, was it an adventure getting there. We, of course, are going to start from the very beginning and work our way up to the present. Uh, we're going to get into all the nitty gritty details. So go ahead and buckle in, babies. 
She was born Jessica Ann Simpson on July 10th, 1980 in Abilene, Texas. Her mother, Tina Ann, and her father, Joseph Simpson. She definitely was raised very actively in the church. Her father was a very active part of his church. And also because of his job, they actually moved around quite a bit. Now, they stayed mostly in Texas, but they did move to the Midwest there for just a couple of years. And while Jessica enjoyed it, she definitely prefers Texas. Texas is where her heart is. Now, Jessica has one sibling. She has a younger sister named Ashley. We all know who Ashley is. She is also a singer. Uh, she was briefly married to Pete Wentz for a little while, had a child with him. Let me know if you guys would like me to talk a little bit more about Ashley because I feel like her love story, her journey is just as interesting. But Jessica was very active in the church. She loved singing in the choir. It was one of her very favorite parts of the church going experience. And she pretty much lived for Sundays when she could get up there and sing. Now, very early on, her father, Joe, definitely realized and recognized that there was some serious talent there. And because of that, pushed Jessica into uh, auditioning for things like the Mickey Mouse Club, things like that. Uh, he re recognized that his daughter had the potential to be famous and definitely actively pursued that. Now, Jessica did end up applying and auditioning for the Mickey Mouse Club. She was in the same round as Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera. However, uh, she was not quite as confident in her skills as maybe she would have liked. Uh, and because of that, when she went and did her audition, her audition was right after Christina, and I couldn't imagine trying to go out there and sing after Christina either. She's a vocal powerhouse. So, of course, Jessica goes out there after Christina, absolutely bombs the audition, and she ends up getting passed over for the Mickey Mouse Club. Now, Jessica does not really let this phase her too awful much. She ends up going back to Texas, and she continues to sing in choir, all of that good stuff, but she never quite loses hope. She continued to sing in her church choir until she was eventually discovered by a Christian music label. And they recognized her talent, thought she definitely had something that they could capitalize off of, and they ended up signing her. Now, at this point, Jessica is still very, very young. She has not quite fully developed yet. And as they start to kind of work on her first record, start to get songs together, things like that. Uh, she begins to record. She also begins to mature. And she goes from being a very adorable, sweet, cute little child into being a very, very beautiful young woman. And uh, with quite a bit of sex appeal, quite honestly. And for this Christian music label, this is not the image that they're looking for. And they end up releasing Jessica from her contract because her image no longer fits what they are, you know, what they're into, right? They said that her whole vibe was just all out too sexual for the brand. Now, of course, Jessica, at this point, it's just, she's not trying to be that way. She can't help the way that she looks. However, they just don't want any part of it. So again, she tucks her tail and she goes back to Texas and she continues to sing in the choir. Now, she gets very, very lucky and she is eventually discovered one more time, and this time she is discovered by none other than the Tommy Matola. Now, at this point in time, Tommy is actually married to Mariah Carey. That is a big, long freaking episode. Uh, that is a story in and of itself. We will get there eventually. Just a whole lot that goes into that story. However, Tommy Matola discovers Jessica. Uh, one of his one of his little henchmen actually discovers Jessica. She brings Jessica to Tommy's attention and Tommy's like, yeah, there's definitely something there. Bring her in. So she goes in and Tommy sees her and instantly is like, yes. Uh, and of course, this is the time of Britney Spears and Mandy Moore and Christina Aguilera. It is the era of the blonde pop goddess, right? And Jessica fits right in perfectly. But also Tommy thinks that there's just something a little bit different. There's something different enough about Jessica that she might be able to actually compete with the Britneys and the Christinas, right? 
So he brings her in and he instantly starts working on her, working on this, this first album, and he instantly starts promoting her. Now, in case you didn't know, Tommy Mottola worked was the head of Columbia Records. So Jessica is now signed with Columbia Records. She is now, uh, you know, pretty much a recording artist. And the doors to Hollywood and all of uh, those opportunities are now open to her. And before she even has her first single out, before she has her first album done, Tommy has her out and about. He's got her uh, shaking hands and kissing babies. Like she is, it is her self-promotion era. He's basically just trying to get her out there, get her seen, and garner a little bit of interest. Eventually, Jessica garners enough interest that they feel like it is the right time to release her first debut album. Uh, her first single is I Want to Love You Forever. Uh, that was released on September 28th, 1999. Uh, it reached number three on the Billboard Top 200. Uh, not bad at all. Ended up being certified platinum, which is not bad for an artist's first release. And that first album, Sweet Kisses, actually reached number 25 on the charts. So it, pre it did pretty well for her. Now, it wasn't a number one smash hit like a Britney or a Christina, but of course it was just her first album. They have time to get there. Three years later, she releases her second album, Irresistible, and it does all right, uh, not quite as well as the first one. And at this point, it's just kind of like, she's just kind of mid, right? And that is not a bad thing at all in any way, shape or form. Just saying that she never did have the vocal power to really get to number one on the charts. And because of this, she started to kind of diversify her portfolio just a little bit. And this is when she starts dipping toes into acting and fashion brands, things like that. Now, all in all, Jess has released about seven studio albums. She's had about 19 singles and then also 15 music videos. And the music videos is really where Jessica made her money. Uh, just because, of course, we all like to look at her. She's freaking stunning. I actually went and I looked at her Instagram profile while I was researching for this video. And y'all, this woman is still so stupidly gorgeous. She, she looks like she hasn't aged a freaking day. She's in her 40s at this point, and she is stunning. She still looks so stupidly beautiful. Ugh, it makes me dislike her just a little bit. The most lucrative venture that Jessica has ever undertaken is 100% without a doubt the Jessica Simpson collection. Now this collection has made her a, a, a multi-millionaire. She actually has a net worth that is upwards of $200 million. Most of this is due to the Jessica Simpson collection. It is extensive and it is absolute fire. Uh, actually, I, I own many things from the Jessica Simpson collection. Uh, she really started out with shoes, but then she branched out into accessories and clothing. She branched out into homeware, uh, fragrances, all kinds of things. Uh, she has a, she has, she's dipped a toe into just about everything. And because of that, uh, she has done really, really well for herself. On top of the fact that her taste is very middle America. Like she is a middle America girl. She is a girl. She just, she dresses like all of us want to dress, right? It's not too much. It's not too little, but it's just perfect. With And the shoes, some of the shoes that this woman has made make my mouth water. They're so freaking beautiful. Also, a lot of her brands are very size inclusive as well. She is very much into producing for plus size women, as well as teeny tiny little women. Uh, she just doesn't discriminate. Uh, and her pieces are classic and timeless and easy to wear. Jessica managed to turn her love of fashion and accessories and shoes into one of the best selling celebrity backed lifestyle brands in the world. And I think for a little blonde girl from Texas, that's not too shabby. I think one of Jessica's biggest hurdles though, and while there have been many, her life has not been all sunshine and roses, uh, but her biggest hurdle is when she almost lost that brand just in general. So around 2005 is when Jessica decides to start the Jessica Simpson collection, right? And basically what it is, is it is a, it's like a licensing thing, right? So she picks products that are manufactured by other people 
and she kind of like buys them. So think of the Jessica Simpson collection as like a store and it's kind of like an umbrella for all of these other little things and she just kind of buys from this person and this person and she just kind of picks things that she likes, slaps her name on it and then sells it as her own, right? But because of this, uh, it was, it's very time consuming and she needed somebody to help her kind of like source the material, right? Because they're not actually manufacturing anything. They're licensing things. So she needed somebody that was going to do the buying for her. She needed somebody that had a vision and was going to be able to, you know, find the good deals, find the good brands, quality pieces, things like that. And in comes Vince Camuto. And he is probably one of my favorite designers uh, of all time. So his fragrances are some of my very favorites of all time. Uh, Bella is just absolutely one of the most beautiful fragrances you will ever smell in your life. But so he becomes her chief kind of buyer. Like he is her go-to guy when uh, finding new pieces, things like that. And business is doing great up until about 2015. And in 2015, Vince unfortunately passes away and Jessica needs to find another go-to guy and she kind of like really doesn't know what to do with herself. Uh, in 2015, Jessica had some serious struggles going on. She had some things in her own life that she was dealing with and at that point decided that she really just couldn't. She could not be the brand owner that she wanted to be or that she needed to be. So she ended up selling the majority stake to another company. Now, she did keep a small portion of her company because, again, it's her name, but she sold the majority stake to another company, and she entrusted this company to really take care of her brand and continue things the way that they were going, right? What ends up happening is this company absolutely runs her business and her name into the ground. Uh, they're on the verge of bankruptcy. Just four years after she had sold the majority stake of her company, she realizes that it's on the verge of no longer existing. Now, in 2019, this is when she's kind of finally overcome some of her struggles and she feels like she is emotionally physically, mentally, she is ready to kind of step back in to that role. And she decides that she's going to fight for her company. She's going to fight for her name. She's going to try to buy back the majority stake and she's going to bring her company back to life. Now it takes her two years and every single dime she has, but she is eventually able to successfully buy back the majority stake of her company and then it's time to really start bringing this company back from the from the edge of darkness, right? So she does. She puts all of her time and effort. She mortgages her houses. Her mom mortgages her houses. Like they put, they pull together and they put every single dime they own back into this business and they revive it in a very, very big way. They bring it back from the edge of bankruptcy and they build it back up into a, a into a, a billion dollar business. Uh, right now, the Jessica Simpson collection is estimated to have a collective worth of about $1 billion. Now, of course, that $1 billion is not in Jessica's pocket because it is a licensing thing. However, she is responsible for the success of her brand. Uh, after 2019, when she was able to finally buy back the rights to her name and her business, she really put all of her time and effort into it and really rebuilt it into something truly amazing and something she's super, super proud of. And y'all, I think she's got every right to be. Now that we have all of her business ventures out of the way, it's time to get down to the nitty gritty and talk about her love life, y'all. This woman's love life has not been a walk in the park either. She definitely has made some really, really awful choices. She's made some pretty good ones too, but uh, it has definitely been a wild ride. Uh, first and foremost, you guys know that we got to start off talking about Jessica and Nick Lachey. Now, Jessica's relationship with Nick is quite possibly her most famous. It's definitely the first relationship I think about when I think about her, uh, her and Nick were such a giant part of my childhood. I remember watching the newlyweds. I remember absolutely drooling over Nick Lachey, wanting to be Jessica Simpson. I just, I remember it all. 
And uh, I feel like still to this day, when people think about Jessica Simpson, they think about Nick Lachey. I think those two are will forever be linked together because of their relationship. Anyway, uh, when it comes to Jess and Nick, it was just all wrong right from the very, very beginning. So Nick and Jess met in 1998. Jessica was only 17 years old at this point. She had just been signed to Columbia Records, and this is during her self-promotion era. So Tommy has got her out just kind of like, again, shaking hands and kissing babies. She's trying to uh, kind of get her face out there, uh, people to kind of like recognize her just a little bit. And because of this, she's going to a ton of parties. She's just being very, very active on the Hollywood music scene. And at this point, Nick and his band, 98 Degrees, are pretty much doing the same thing. They're on their way up. They're just trying to establish themselves. And uh, Nick is quite a bit older than her at this point. Nick is seven, seven years older than her. Uh, she is 17 and Nick is 24 at this point. And they actually end up meeting at a Christmas parade or like a Christmas party. And Nick and his band are scheduled to play at this, at this parade. And Jessica's basically there to just kind of like be seen and they bump into each other at this parade and it's instant fireworks. Now, I don't agree with this because Jessica is very much a minor and Nick is pretty much a grown man at this point. He's 24 and she's 17. And especially when you're that young, that is a very, very big age gap. I know when I was 17, I, it was a very, very different story from when I was 17 to when I was 24. You're at very different points in your life. You want different things. And while you might, you know, you might think, oh, they're both still kids. 17 is a baby compared to a 24 year old. However, Tommy kind of notices this little bit of tension. He kind of notices that there's a little bit of a spark there and he decides that he's going to nurture it. So after Nick and Jessica meet at this parade, they kind of go off, they talk, they flirt, they do their thing, but then they go off and they do their own thing. Now, about a month later, they meet up yet again, this time at a teen people party in Florida, and it's Jessica's turn to perform, and Nick is basically in the crowd, and he's watching everybody react to her. And of course, you got to remember that Jessica is a very, very beautiful young woman, and Nick is in the crowd, and he's watching all of these young people completely ooh and all over her and Nick just falls completely head over heels. He is completely and totally smitten. Now Jessica, she was just all in the very first time she met Nick, but they kind of had to wait for just a little bit. Uh, they really had to wait for her birthday. Uh, and as soon as her birthday kind of hit and she was 18 and she was legal, they instantly got together and they began dating. Now again, I had said that Tommy had noticed the spark. He had noticed the chemistry between them. And as soon as, you know, things were okay and they officially started dating, Tommy decided he was going to find a way to monopolize. He was going to find a way to capitalize off of their attraction, off of their relationship. Because you have Nick, who is pretty much the lead member of 98 Degrees. And, you know, you have women absolutely swooning for Nick, right? Those baby blue eyes that the dimple, like he was just, he was amazing, right? And then you have Jessica, who is barely legal. She is literal catnip for the masses, right? And the girls want to be her and the boys want to be with her. And together, you kind of have this recipe for success, right? You have a, you have a couple with some serious star potential. So Tommy decides he is going to capitalize on this and he ends up sending Jessica out on tour with 98 Degrees. So this tour is basically, it's going to promote both 98 Degrees, but it's also going to promote Jessica. And the thing that's really going to propel this tour to epic proportions is the fact that people are, are going to be not only invested in each of them as artists, but in both of them together as a couple. So just months after they start dating, Nick and Jessica, they end up going out on tour together. They go out on tour in March of 1999. They do their thing. And it was kind of a bit of a wake up call for Jess because this is, Jess, this is Jessica's first 
relationship. Like she has never dated a boy before. She has never been in any kind of relationship. Uh, and again, she had taken a purity pledge. It's all about saving herself for marriage. Uh, she is like, she is a very, very good girl. And then you have Nick, who is, you know, he's kind of like been in this world for just a minute at this moment. And he is like, he is up on stage. And all of a sudden you have Jessica who's having to face crowds, like masses of women trying to get to her boyfriend. And she's having to confront feelings that she's never experienced before. Uh, first and foremost, a butt ton of jealousy. And very quickly, she realizes that one of the kind of cornerstones of her relationship with Nick is going to have to be trust. She is going to have to trust that Nick is going to be able to go out on the road and be faithful to her because this is a big, big deal. Like where there is temptation, there is usually sin, right? And she just knows that if she doesn't trust him, She's going to drive herself crazy because the opportunity is there. Uh, so Nick and her have a conversation and they're very, very like upfront with each other. And Nick, you got to give him, you got to give him credit where credit is due. Nick has always been very marriage minded. He was not a philanderer. He was not somebody that was going to go out and mess around on her things like that. Nick was from the very beginning, very devoted to Jessica, made sure that she knew that he was he only had eyes for her she didn't need to worry about anybody else because she was the only one that he wanted and this gave her a very big sense of security in their relationship and of course Jessica isn't going to go out and do anything else with anyone else because she is saving herself for marriage and her you know she, she's got she's got her sights set on Nick now on top of touring together they also monopolized their relationship that much more because they ended up recording a song together and they recorded where you are and this was one of the this is one of the songs that they did a music video for and this music video it just like it was everything that the people that the fans wanted from Nick and Jessica at that point like it had them kind of crooning for each other and longing for each other like if you've never seen the video you definitely should go check it out it's kind of perfect it is almost a perfect 90s or early 2000s music video and that song did really really well and had audiences just kind of like falling in love with them as a couple even more. Nick and Jessica's relationship is starting to heat up in a very, very big way. Things are starting to get very, very serious. And by this point, Jessica has released her first album and it did all right. But now she is experiencing a ton of pressure for her second album to do just as well. And because of this, she just kind of like, she, she just is very overwhelmed. So she ends up telling Nick that she's got to take a step back from them and their relationship for just a little while. So they break up, but they only break up for just a few months. And then very shortly thereafter, 9-11 happens. And when 9-11 happens, it really brings things into perspective for both Nick and Jessica. Now, they both had agreed to see other people while they had taken this short break. They had both gone out. I think they each saw one other person and they decided that after this like gigantic tragedy happened, uh, they realized where their priorities were. And both Jessica and Nick realized that they didn't want to spend a single minute apart. Like if they could be together, they might as well just be together. And so they end up reuniting. And about, I want to say about a month after they get back together, Nick ends up getting down on one knee and he ends up proposing to Jessica. In February of 2002, Nick asked Jessica to be his wife. Uh, Nick proposed while they vacationed on a yacht in Hawaii with a pear-shaped diamond ring and of course, Jessica said, yes, it was an emphatic yes. She was like, oh yeah, let's do it. Let's go for it. And they got married pretty quickly thereafter. Uh, I think they had an eight month long engagement, uh, just long enough to really plan this fairy tale wedding. Jess and Nick got married on October 26th, 2002. And their wedding was, it was nothing short of a fairy tale, like right out of a, right out of a book. Their wedding would be the start for their show. It would be featured in the first couple episodes of Newlyweds. And 
so this wedding is big right just because from texas they do things big in texas she very much lives by that motto uh, they had about 350 guests it was amazing in this super cute little church in austin texas and jessica got married in a custom vera wang gown and she walked down the aisle while nick's bandmates serenaded her it was beautiful and of course it was oh it was it was everything she wanted it to be and more uh and i remember watching it and being like mm -hmm, this doesn't really quite feel right because it doesn't like it just nick just didn't look right during that entire ordeal just kind of felt like he was kind of lost or and it felt like she was just kind of like going through the motions i'm not sure either way they ended up getting married it was a blast the wedding was absolutely beautiful and then very shortly thereafter they start shooting for their show the newlyweds so they begin shooting their tv series it ends up getting released about a year after they get married in august uh, on august 19th 2003 and it is an instant freaking smash hit like everybody absolutely cannot get enough everybody loves their dynamic like they're such a weird couple because they're such different people it's kind of crazy so you have nick who's about 28 years old at this point he's a little bit more mature he is a little bit older he's a little bit more serious and quite and quite honestly a little bit of a grumpy old man then you have Jessica, who is very young. She doesn't take anything seriously. Everything is a joke. And their dynamic is just, it's odd. It is odd to say the least. Now, I look back on it now, now that I am a grown woman and have been married for 14 years, and I can see very, very instantly that there are problems. There are problems in, in paradise, and they never, ever, ever should have gotten married. First of all, that age difference was just, it was too big of a bridge to gap. Like it was, it, it was too big of a gap to bridge either way. Like it was too big. Uh, they were very, very different at very different stages in their lives. And Jessica wasn't ready to grow up and be what Nick needed to, her to be. And Nick didn't have the patience or, you know, even the really, the want to to, 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 to wait for her. You have Nick who wants Jessica to step up almost instantly and be pretty much like a, almost kind of like a stay at home wifey. Like he wants her to cook and he wants her to keep the house clean. And he wants her to like host dinner parties and things like that. And then you have Jessica who really just wants to go out and eat out. She doesn't want to cook, right? She doesn't want to, she doesn't want to clean the house. She doesn't know how to hang up a piece of clothing up on a hanger. She doesn't know how to wash dish. And you have Nick who's trying to like have this very domesticated kind of like homemaker scene. And Jessica just wants to go out and drink and party and have fun. And because of that, they end up clashing. And I think it was pretty apparent pretty quickly in their relationship that it wasn't going to work. But because they had signed on to do three seasons of this show, they end up kind of, they end up acting. And what ends up happening is the act becomes the line between what's real and what's reality TV becomes very, very blurred. And so even when the cameras aren't rolling, Nick and Jessica, they don't know when to, they don't know when to turn off. It becomes very difficult to distinguish between reality Nick and Jess and TV Nick and Jess. And so even when the cameras cut off, they just continued to play their parts. So they just start to kind of, they just kind of start to ignore the red signs or the red flags and just kind of like keep on keeping on until everything just kind of explodes and they can't they can't lie to themselves anymore. Nick ended up becoming really really judgmental and he ended up almost trying to control her. Uh, I feel like he thought that if he could be strict enough that he could change her and kind of mold her into the wife that he wanted her to be. And I think Jessica just got tired of trying. She got tired of trying to be the wife that Nick wanted her to be because that just wasn't who she was. She just wasn't that domesticated kind of like stay at home wifey that Nick wanted so, so badly. And I think pretty, pretty shortly after they got married, they realized that this was a big, big mistake. But again, because they had signed on for three, uh, three seasons 
of the show. They were kind of stuck together because, again, they can't give the money back. Uh, they're not going to give the money back. So they basically just kind of have to wait out the contract. And that's exactly what they do. Uh, by the time the last season of The Newlyweds aired, they were basically just roommates. Uh, they were just trying to get through their commitments so that they could go ahead and, and go their separate ways. And that's exactly what they did. Now, I think one of the biggest catalysts that really drove home the fact that they were done and that they needed to get a divorce was that Jessica ended up getting cast in The Dukes of Hazard. Now, I know we all remember this movie. I remember this movie not only because I really enjoyed the movie, but also because of Jessica's music video. These booths are made for walk-in. I remember that music video. I watched it over and over and over again. She was freaking stunning. She was so stupidly beautiful in that music video. And these booths are made for walk-in, one of my very favorite songs of all time anyway. And I really just loved what she did with the song. I've always had a thing for Sean William Scott. Scott, anyway, it was just, it was a great movie. She did really great in her role as Daisy Duke. Uh, but during this time, uh, she got very, very close to Johnny Knoxville. Now, where it got around on set that something funky was going on between Jessica and Johnny. Now, Johnny, who... Uh, <sighs> is uh, is is a little bit of a piece of work in and of his own right because this man was married at the time had a wife however rumors get going that Jessica and Johnny are getting pretty close on set they're being a little bit lovey-dovey uh something a little bit funky is going on and of course word travels fast Hollywood is a big town but it's it's, it's really not uh it's a big town but a little world and word quickly got back to Nick about, you know, there was something funny going on. So Nick ends up showing up on set, causes a whole big kerfuffle. And at that point, it's just kind of like the relationship was over. Uh, so again, Jessica kind of got a little bit of a bad rep because the, the news of the affair kind of got out. Now, nothing physical ever happened between Jessica and Johnny but there definitely was an emotional affair going on. Uh, and she does end up speaking about it in her biography. Uh, Jessica, she wrote a book and she talks about all of this uh, in that book. I remember, I think it was released maybe about, I want to say a year ago, and it was a big deal when it got released. Uh, but she did say that Johnny just made her feel like an actual person. When it came to Nick, he just, he never thought anything she had to say was important. He never listened to what she had to say. He just... She just didn't feel important. And Johnny just made her feel special. And, you know, I know as a mother and as a wife, I know that sometimes we can feel very unseen. We can feel very taken for granted. And then when someone comes along and makes us feel heard and seen, it can be very, very intoxicating, especially when you're in a bad situation at home. It can be a spot of sunshine in, uh, in a very, very dark day. Uh, so Jessica, she ends up, uh, she ends up kind of like, uh, succumbing to temptation, right? Uh, and she enters into this emotional affair with Johnny. She gets found out. And at this point, her, her marriage is done. Now, after Jessica ends up finishing this movie, she goes home and she takes four months with Nick and they really do try to work it out. They try to you know, they try to figure out if there is anything worth saving, if their marriage is something that they even want to work on anymore. And they both come to the conclusion that no, it's not. Uh, they both just want to be done with it. So on November 23rd, 2005, this is when they, uh, they end up coming out with a joint statement. And they basically just tell everybody that we're done. We're going to file for divorce and Nick and Jessica are no more. And the joint statement is just about as generic as every other joint statement I've read on True Love Tuesday. I'm going to read it for you anyway. They all basically say the same thing. After three years of marriage and careful thought and consideration, we have decided to part ways. This is the mutual decision of two people with an enormous amount of respect and admiration for each other. We hope that you will respect our privacy during this difficult time. So basically saying that we both want to get a divorce. We're both done. 
like nobody's leaving anybody else we're not going to badmouth each other we just don't want to be married anymore now jessica was the one to file for divorce first uh she filed on december 16th just about three weeks after they released this joint statement now she cited irreconcilable differences but her documentation also stated that she requested nick not receive spousal support and this is going to be a little bit of an indicator about how this divorce situation is gonna go because at this point Jessica is definitely worth more than Nick is. Uh, Nick has kind of like he's kind of outgrown his boy band status. He's like a 30 year old man at this point right so he's not a boy bander anymore. He's not really doing a whole lot. Uh, he's not really focusing on his career or anything like that. Now he did end up coming out with a solo album after they got divorced and it did okay but he never really did uh, he, he, he never really did make it big. So Jessica who is worth quite a bit of money at this point her career is going beautifully. Uh, so Nick decides that he is going to take the role of victim. He is going to take Jessica's rumored infidelity. He is going to take that. He's going to run with that. And he is going to paint himself as the victim throughout this entire uh, process. He goes to the tabloids and he tells them that he was blindsided by the entire thing. Like he had no idea that Jessica wasn't happy in their marriage. Blah, blah, blah. You guys know the story, which was complete and total bullarkey. Nick had known that this relationship was over for just as long as Jessica had. However, he was able to manipulate the tabloids in such a way that he very much looked like, you know, he very much looked like the victim. And, you know, we all saw it coming. But of course, Nick refused to agree on any of the financial, uh, on a financial settlement. He refused to agree uh, to anything that Jessica's lawyers proposed, Nick was going to make sure that he walked away from that marriage with as much as he possibly could. Uh, because again, his career was really not panning out the way that he had anticipated it. And Jessica was basically funding his lifestyle at this point. And now that his cash cow has decided to kind of walk away, he's got he's got to try to pad his bank account as much as he possibly can. And that's exactly what he does. Now, uh, Jessica and her lawyers are able to get the judge to bifurcate. I think that's how you say that. And basically what that means is the divorce was uh, kind of like pushed forward and uh, legalized. So they were legally divorced. However, the financial aspect of the divorce just wasn't, it wasn't finalized yet. So they are well and truly divorced at this point, but they're still in mediation. Now, it would take another six months. It would take another six months for Nick to finally agree to the terms of the, uh, what do they call that? The equitable, equi equitable division of assets, however you say that. Uh, but it took another six months for Nick to finally agree on a settlement. And he walked away with a rather large chunk of Jessica's bank account. Now, Jessica would later go on to say that marrying Nick was her biggest financial mistake. Like it was her biggest money mistake were the words that she used. But she said marrying Nick without a prenuptial agreement because, of course, she is a baby at this point in time. Like she was only 20, 21 when they got married. So she wasn't thinking about it ever ending. Like, he was her prince charming. This was her fairy tale. They were never ever going to get uh, divorced. There was no reason for a prenup. So after she kind of blew up after newlyweds and started making all of this money, it became a big problem. And Nick ended up walking away with quite a few of her assets. Now, when it comes to Nick, uh, Nick kind of, he went on and he did find love again. Uh, I feel like when it comes to Nick, he definitely, he just wanted to be married. Uh, I feel like he very much is a romantic at heart. And while Jessica was not the one for him, doesn't mean that he was necessarily a bad guy or a, uh, a bad partner. It just means they were kind of toxic for each other. After Nick and Jessica split, Nick would go on to meet and then eventually marry uh, TV host Vanessa Manillo. Now, they began dating before the ink had even dried on the divorce decree. They began dating before Nick had even agreed on the financial settlement, right? So this is, the, this is the only part where men give women so much crap for not wanting to agree to a financial settlement, but nobody gave him any kind of 
uh, nobody gave him any kind of flack for the fact that he really did try to milk Jessica for everything that she was worth. And that really does bother me just a little bit. They actually ended up getting married on Sir Richard Branson's private island, Necker Island, in the British Virgin Islands. And they got married in front of about 35 people. Their wedding was pretty much a surprise. Uh, basically, their wedding invitations were plane tickets and everybody just kind of had to like go with it. So everybody gets to this island and it is a really beautiful, very intimate, very romantic ceremony. Now, the thing about this though is the thing about Nick's relationship with Vanessa is it is so incredibly similar to the timeline of his relationship with Jessica because they dated for a few years, they broke up, and then after they got back together, they ended up getting engaged very very shortly thereafter. And then they too ended up filming their wedding, and actually it was broadcast on TLC. So Nick tried to recreate the success of the newlyweds with his new wife, Vanessa. However, it never did quite take off like the newlyweds did. So we kind of had to just like uh, drop it. But he did. He very much tried to uh, recapture the magic and just wasn't quite as successful with it. Now, while he might not have been able to capitalize off of his new marriage as much as he had the first, his second marriage was definitely more successful than the first. Uh, him and Vanessa are still married to this day. They have three children together. They're ridiculously happy and they obviously did something right uh, when they got together uh, because they are, uh, I, there's uh, there's really no drama surrounding them. I did, I went and checked on her Instagram page as well. They look deliriously happy together. Their children are happy and beautiful and healthy. So uh, there is, I have, I hold nothing against Nick at all. I just feel like his relationship with Jessica was incredibly toxic. It was something that probably should never have happened but uh, it definitely was a, a learning lesson and Nick learned his lesson and definitely got it right with his second try. Now, when it comes to Jessica and moving on after Nick, she unfortunately did not get anywhere near as lucky as Nick did, at least not right off the bat. Uh, so she did after she got out of her relationship with Nick, Jessica kind of played around for a little bit. Uh, she had spent the most, the better part of her 20s with Nick and pretty much her entire adult life up to this point uh, being Nick's girlfriend. So of course, after they get their divorce, she's gonna wanna go out. She's gonna wanna play around just a little bit, uh, play the field and experience things. And that's exactly what she did. Now, unfortunately, she ended up getting her heart broke quite a few times in the process but it eventually led to her happily ever after. So pretty quickly after she and Nick broke up, she ends up dating Adam Levine. And Adam Levine, I don't have a very high opinion of that man at all whatsoever. Uh, I've heard some really awful things about him and the way that he treats women. We're not gonna get into that at the moment, but he was not kind to Jessica either. They kind of hooked up in January of 2006 when, and it was kind of like confirmed, was rumored that they were hooking up when she was seen leaving the Chateau Marmont in Los Angeles after supposedly spending the night at Adam's house. Now, they kind of hooked up on and off for about three months until Adam just kind of like ghosted her. He texted her, I, well, he didn't ghost her, I guess, but he texted her and told her that he didn't want to see her anymore and just kind of like dropped her like a bad habit, which I think is positively disgusting. But I don't think Adam really hurt that much because he was basically just a rebound for her. She was basically just trying to, to get some new experiences after she had divorced Nick. So that lasted for about three months and then they kind of went their separate ways. Now, after Adam is when she gets her first, like her first big heartbreak after her divorce from Nick. So arguably her most toxic relationship to date was her relationship with John Mayer. And John Mayer did an absolute just a doozy on this woman. He mind, he messed with her mind so, so badly. And not only that, but he did lasting damage on her self-esteem, things like that. So after she ends up uh, divorcing Nick, she kind of like just reinvents herself a little bit. She dyes her hair brown. She goes from being this blonde bombshell to this brunette baddie. 
she gets with John and they're like they're kind of a beautiful couple and when it comes to John Jessica is completely and totally out of her league now at this point Jessica has only really been uh with two men like kind of we know for sure that she's been with Nick we think she's been with Adam but at this point she is still a very inexperienced very she's she's very very she's a novice when it comes to playing the game especially in Hollywood and then you have John who is a notorious ladies man he is notorious for kind of like chewing up women and spitting them out he's dated some of the most beautiful women in Hollywood so when John and Jessica get together it's kind of like it's mind-blowing a little bit now Jessica would end up seeing John throughout the rest of 2006 and this would be a very very tumultuous time in her love life uh this would be like she, he put her through the absolute ringer in the very short amount of time that they were together they broke up nine times uh and it just it, it, she never knew where she stood with John and he he broke her he broke her in a million ways now when it came to their relationship the sensual or physical part of the relationship was a no-brainer they were both incredibly attracted to each other uh john was infamously recorded like he went on an interview and i think it was with playboy and he called jessica sexual napalm he said she was completely and totally addictive and while i do understand that physical attraction is super super freaking important when that's all that you have it's not really a relationship it's a situationship and it just wasn't good. It just wasn't good for Jessica in any way, shape, or form. John was incredibly abusive to her, both mentally, not not physically, but mentally and emotionally. He just kind of like jerked her all over the place. So when they finally called it quits for good, uh, it was kind of like a good riddance. But still, this man had some kind of hold over her. And this would go on to affect her next relationship as well. So after John, Jessica ends up dating Tony Romo. And this is a relationship that could have been very, very good for her. Now, this relationship lasted for about two years. And throughout the duration of this relationship, Jessica is the one that messed things up. And it was because she couldn't let John go. So throughout her entire relationship with Tony, Jessica is still in contact with John. Uh, he had some kind of hold over her. She couldn't quite escape him. And Tony was just tired. He was tired of being put last. He was tired of like, you know, he's an athlete, right? Uh, so he's not going to be anybody's second best. And when she wouldn't stop talking to John, Tony was just like done. And I think Tony left Jessica probably in the most devastating way he possibly could because after dating for about two years, Tony ends up telling her, he ends up breaking up with her the day before her 29th birthday. Uh, so that was, that was kind of a big deal and it was kind of a butthole thing to do. But I also think that Jessica kind of saw it coming because again, she had stayed in contact with John throughout their relationship. And I know that if my partner was in, was still in contact with their ex and I was aware that they weren't completely over them, I'd have a pretty big problem with that too. So I do think that Tony was justified in breaking off their uh, relationship. I just think that he could have gone about it in a, in a slightly more kind way. So Jessica dates Tony from 2007 to 2009. And then after that, she uh, she's not really in another big relationship after that. Now, She's always been really good friends with a man by the name of Billy Corgan. And there was a little bit of a rumor that they were in a relationship together. But a lot of that is, I think a lot of people think that that was just more of a friendship kind of thing. It might have been a friends with benefit kind of situation. But for the most part, I think Billy was just an emotional support for her. And while there might have been something physical going on, I don't think that there was ev ever any real potential for a lasting relationship there uh but they were seen hanging out together quite a few times out and about on the town but uh very very shortly thereafter is when jessica ends up meeting eric and eric johnson ends up being the knight in shining armor her prince charming he ends up being everything that jessica had ever wished for 
and more. Now, Eric, Mr. Prince Charming, was born Eric Maxwell Johnson on September 15th, 1979. Uh, he is a former NFL tight end. He used to play for the San Francisco 49ers, had a really, had a pretty good career, and then ended up retiring. Now, Eric was married once before he met Jessica. He was married to a stylist by the name of Carrie D'Angelo. Now, his divorce from Carrie was not good. It was a very bitter, very long divorce. Carrie did not, she did not want to divorce Eric. Uh, and also, I think what added a little bit of fuel to the fire was the fact that Eric moved on so quickly with Jessica after the divorce. Now, I did check into if there was any kind of like overlap or if there could have been any cheating going on between Jessica and Eric while he was going through his divorce with Carrie. And from what I could find out, from what I could suss out, that is not what caused the divorce. Eric and Carrie got married on May 14th, 2005, but separated in October of 2009. And then they're, they filed for divorce in January of 2009. And then their divorce was finalized in October of 2010. Eric and Jessica didn't meet until April of 2010. And by that time, the divorce had already been filed. Uh, they had already been separated for a good amount of time. So there really isn't any overlap between uh, Carrie and Jessica. Now, there were some rumors going around that Eric was still sleeping with Carrie when he first met Jessica and continued to sleep with Carrie for the first month of his relationship with Jessica. Now, from what I could find in my research, it doesn't seem very plausible just because from the minute that Eric and Jessica met, their relationship went by and kind of progressed really, really quickly. Uh, and within just a couple of months of them being together, they were already pretty much living together. So I really don't see much room for, you know, that overlap to have happened. And like I said, the divorce was filed so, so long before Eric and Jessica even met. I just don't think that the overlap rumors have any merit to them at all whatsoever. So with all of that out of the way, uh, Eric and Jessica, their relationship is just about as romantic and kind of like love at first sight as it really gets. So Eric and Jessica met at a house party hosted by one of their mutual friends. I couldn't figure out which friend that was, but they meet at a house party and they instantly hit it off. They are both immediately intensely attracted to each other. Uh, Jessica is just like, mm, -hmm. it's a big old hunk of burning love. And of course, Eric's into her because she's Jessica freaking Simpson and she's stunning, right? Uh, but not only did they hit it off on a physical level, but they also hit it off emotionally and mentally as well. They were both in a, at a point in their lives where they were ready for something real. And uh, they, they met and they kind of like, they connected on all levels. And that's a direct quote from Jessica. They started dating pretty quickly after that first meeting, and then their relationship progressed really, really quickly thereafter. Now, for all intents and purposes, Jessica and Eric's courtship was extremely uneventful. And quite honestly, after the last couple of years uh, and the trauma that had been kind of dumped on Jessica through all of the men that she had kind of been messing around with up to this point, uneventful was a good thing. She didn't need any more surprises. She didn't need any more, like, uh, no more jump scares. She just wanted something that was easy and real, and she just wanted a real connection with somebody, and that is exactly what she found in Eric. Kind of was, like, almost perfect from the very, very beginning, uh, and I think one of the biggest reasons that everything just kind of went so perfectly was the fact that though Eric was an athlete and he was, you know, still, you know, in his prime, things like that, he was retired. So he had the time to really devote himself to Jessica, which is really what she wanted and needed at that point in time. I think where Jessica's relationship with Eric differed from Tony's is the fact that Eric was retired. Now, he was still in prime condition. He's not an old man by any means, but he was retired. He had established himself in his career of choice, and then he had walked away when he was ready to. Uh, and because of that, there were no crazy fans that she had to deal with. There were, were no crazy schedules that she had to deal with. And 
Eric was pretty much open to really devote himself to her and really give her as much time as she needed. And I think Jessica was, she really needed that. She needed somebody that was willing to just kind of like drop everything and just come be with her. Now, when Eric and Jessica met, Eric was enrolled in classes. He was enrolled in a business course at, I think it was Penn's Warner, Wharton. He was taking business classes, trying to further his education, but he dropped out and just kind of like, he dropped everything to just go and be with Jessica. And I think that devotion and that show of devotion so early on in their relationship is really what cemented their bond and their connection. After they had been dating for about two months, it was Jessica's 30th birthday. They took off on a vacation. They went and they went to Italy and they had an absolute blast. And of course they're out on boats and they're enjoying the Mediterranean and all, the, all of the good things, right? And of course, uh, during this trip, they fell even more madly in love with each other. And by the time they got back, they were well and truly like a very, very solid, solid couple. Now, the only thing standing in the way of their happily ever after at this point is Eric's impending divorce with Carrie. Now, that finally gets, uh, it, finally, it gets finalized, I guess, in October of 2010. And then just, I think, maybe a month later in November, Eric drops down to one knee, and this is when he asks Jessica to marry him. Now, at this point, they've only been dating for like six months, and at six months, that, that was all Eric needed. That was all he needed to know that this was the woman he wanted to spend the rest of his life with, and of course, Jessica was all in. She was like, yep, we're doing this. Uh, no, no take backs, right? So he gives her this ring. She says yes, and they have a very, very long engagement. Now, the only reason that their engagement ended up being as long as it was is because they couldn't stop having babies. They could not stop having babies long enough for Jessica to be able to fit into a wedding dress. They actually ended up having to postpone their wedding twice due to pregnancies. So I want to say about a year after their engagement, uh, they have their first baby, uh, Maxwell Drew Johnson. They have her on May 1st, 2012. And then uh, by the end of that year, they were pregnant with baby number two. They had their son, Ace Johnson, uh, in June, on June 30th of 2013. Now, after that, Jessica, she shut down. She shut down the baby making factory. She was done. She was very, very ready to actually get married. Uh, they were both very ready to just go ahead and walk down the aisle. They had been engaged for like three years at this point. And th I mean, that's, that's, that's plenty long enough. Like it, it's time to just go ahead and get her done. Uh, so that's exactly what they did. Uh, they planned their wedding and had an absolutely beautiful wedding. Very, very Texas, very... I think their wedding was very reminiscent of who they are as people and as a couple. They finally got married on July 5th, 2014, and in an extremely like an extravagant yet really romantic and kind of like down home uh, wedding ceremony. Y'all, their wedding cost about $1.4 million. Like I said, Jess doesn't do anything small. They got married at the San Isidro Ranch in Montecito, California, and basically it wasn't just like a one-day affair. It was an entire weekend. Uh, they had about 300, about 300 of their very closest friends and family in attendance, and the entire weekend they basically just kind of like had barbecues and like played horseshoes just enjoyed the outdoors. The whole theme of the wedding was very much like down home, like down on the ranch, very, very Texas. It felt very Texas, but like upscale kind of Texas. Anyway, uh, their son was their ring bearer. Their daughter was their flower girl. It was beautiful. Uh, Jessica looked absolutely stunning. Eric looked incredibly handsome. And y'all, it's been, it's been pretty much a fairy tale since then. Now, of course, their relationship hasn't all been sunshine and rainbows. They have had a few bumps and bruises along the way, uh, specifically when you talk about 
uh, Jessica's alcohol addiction. Now, by 2017, Jessica's alcohol abuse had pretty much reached its pink and everything kind of culminated on Halloween of that year when she was just too intoxicated. She had planned this big giant uh, Halloween event and her kids were like, she had a bunch of people over to the house and all she could do was go lay down in bed because she was so drunk she couldn't participate in the actual party and at that point she realized that she really needed to do something she really needed to clean herself up she needed to take care of her health and uh because she wasn't she wasn't taking care of anything she wasn't taking care of her husband she wasn't there for her kids and the whole kids thing like she is Jessica is a fantastic fantastic mother and when she let her kids down that was when she really realized that it just wasn't sustainable anymore. So she ended up going to therapy. She ended up getting her life back in order. And she's been sober for I think about like six or seven years at this point. So once she really put her foot down and said no more, she really, really stuck to it. They welcomed their third little love bug, Miss Birdie May, on March 19th, 2019. And since then, they've basically just been living their best lives. There have been no drama. There's been no cheating, like rumors or scandals. They basically are the perfect Hollywood couple. And I really do think that they deserve it so, so very much. It genuinely seems like Jessica finally found her Prince Charming. She might've had to kiss a few frogs to get there, but she got there in the end. And that's what really matters. Guys, I loved this story so, so much. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. This is today's finished look. What do we think? Do we like it? Do we love it? Let me know in the comments below. If you did enjoy today's video, don't forget to give it a big old thumbs up before you leave. As always, no filters, no fancy lighting. It is just me sitting in front of my camera telling you guys an epic love story. Hoping you guys are enjoying what I'm doing. I love you so, so very much. And until next time, stay safe, take care of yourselves, and remember, you're important. Bye.